In our study of the identifying marks of the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18, Acts chapter 2, then we want to note that one of the chief identifying marks of the church is uh, that Jesus built is that it gives scriptural answers to the question of what must I do to be saved? In the church of our Lord, we who are members are so used to addressing that question and hearing it all the time used in various sermons and classes over the years that maybe we don't realize the high significance of that question. First of all, we need to understand that a lot of people have to understand a great many things before they're even brought to asking that question. But it is indicative of one who has truly thought of his relationship to God. When you say, what must I do to be saved? Well, say from what? This world is blind to sin. It's the greatest enemy man has. The only thing that can keep any of us out of heaven, and how often have I said this, is to die guilty of sin before God. Sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is ultimately and finally, no matter who else it may involve or whatever else it may involve, against God. And thus, He being a perfectly just God, when we sin, whatever the sin may be, great in man's eyes or little in man's eyes, that doesn't make any difference. Having great consequences immediate in this life by committing it or maybe never noticed, except by God, of course. None of that makes any difference to it being the fact that it's a sin, a violation of God's law. And God being perfectly just, as I said, cannot tolerate that. But what we have is a way of salvation because God has favored us and extended His mercy to us. Mercy means that we stand guilty before God. And when we cry for mercy, we are admitting we sinned. We did it. We are responsible. Nobody else. I can't pass the book. I am where I am as being lost, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death. It's separation from God in this life. And then if we die unforgiven, eternal separation from God in a devil's hell. So when we think about that, then we must realize that we're saying, what must I do to be saved from sin? For God to save me from my sin. For God to have mercy on me. Because I admit I've sinned. So you see, it takes a while in the teaching of the truth to get people even to that point, to where they know what sin is. The enormity and gravity of sin. The enemy that it is, because it's Satan who goeth around all the time, as diligently as it's possible for that supernatural evil being to do to get us to transgress God's law and to never find forgiveness, to blind us to the need of forgiveness. So there's a lot to be done before you get a person to the point where he will cry out, what shall I do? What shall we do to be saved? Saved from our sins, saved from the guilt of sin, the eternal consequences of sin. That's what we want. We want peace of mind with God. But if the person doesn't believe in God or the deity of Christ or the Bible is the Word of God, if they don't know what life in the flesh is all about, then there's a lot of work on our part as members of the Church of our Lord to get them to understand, as we're trying to do in these uh, series of sermons on the Church and the New Testament identifying marks of it, to know just how God saves us and the need of being saved from our sin and what happens if we die in sin. If you look in Acts chapter 2, the day the church started, those people, though they had misunderstandings of the kingdom and the Messiah and the Jewish people and how they impacted the world and their future and the law of Moses, they still were first to, in the Old Testament. They understood a lot of things. And it would be the New Testament revealed that caused them to understand how the Messiah would save them. 
who he was, how to identify him. And just look at Peter's sermon. And he was standing up with the eleven, the other apostles, and they were preaching also. So we see exactly the proofs offered from heaven and among the apostles as men that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. They had a sharp consciousness of what it was to sin. They understood a covenant relationship with God. It was imperfect, but they understood it. There was a lot in their background that prepared them to hear the gospel and say, Oh, I see, and I see I'm guilty of sin, and I'm separated from God. I'm trying to approach God under religion that was not meant to be the full approach to God that He wants men to take. And so they understood Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Son of God. So it took all of that to bring them to the point where they could honestly say, what must I do to be saved? Now, let's look further into this. The what suggests that there's something, something required of a man in being saved. Look round about you, as I've said all through these sermons, at the denominations. Most all of them, if not all of them, say there's not a thing in the world that a person is required to believe and do in order to be saved from their sins. Sins are against God and sins that separate them from God. But nevertheless, in the very nature of the question, what? That something, something is required of man on his part. And if we want to study further to realize man is a free moral agent, he has the power of choice, he chose to violate God's will, that is to sin, and he can choose to obey God. He can believe the truth or he can believe a lie. He controls his own life, either for good, as the Bible defines good, or bad or evil, as the Bible defines the same. So what? There's something enjoined upon man to do to be saved from his sins against God. Now the word must means that it's not a question of what should I or what may I, but what must I do. It's obligatory. It's inescapable. This is a must. You can't get around it and be saved from your sins. You've got to do it. And of course the big thing about us is we like to pass it on to somebody else. That's been that way from the garden when Adam said to God concerning Eve, who not long before that he had said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Oh, how thankful he was. And now he says, The woman thou gavest me, she did give me and I did eat. So he passed the buck. You know, we uh, ought to know how we operate. People talk about psychology. We ought to know how we operate. And there's a tendency that when we're guilty to say, It's your fault. Everybody but me, it's your fault. And to pass the buck. But it doesn't work, does it? It's not a matter of option. It's a must. It's inescapable if you want salvation from your sins. That is, if you want God, who you sinned against, to forgive you of your sins, to extend His favor to you, and therefore His mercy. The word must then teaches the absolute necessity of the requirement. Then notice the word I. That indicates that it's not what God, or Christ, or the Holy Spirit, or the angels, or some other human being must do. It's a personal matter. Whether you do it or don't do it, I must do it to be saved from my sins. Yet there's a lot of things that go along that says, well, if all these folks won't do what I read the Bible I must do, then that justifies me. No, it doesn't. If the whole world runs after itself and violates God's will, and of course in reality that's what it does, I'm still personally obligated as a human being God created to obey myself, regardless of what anybody else does. All who have any knowledge at all about the Bible knows, of course, that the Godhead plays a part in man's salvation. Each one of the Godhead three having its role, all of that. But you'll see that that is where God does for us we never, what we could not do for ourselves. The love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. But as a free moral agent, that's the way God created us. I have to respond personally to what God says. Choose you this day whom you will serve. I have that power. I can choose to serve God or serve false gods or not serve any God as far as something like that's concerned. But I will end up serving Satan if I do as I please and do not seek to please God. We must understand that there is God's part 
in our salvation. And there's my part, the human part in man's salvation. What must I do? Well, the word do does not mean what I must um, get, what I must uh, think. It doesn't even mean what I must feel or believe. But notice, it is saying there must be a certain activity on my part to be saved by God. A certain activity, something I must do. Actions I must involve myself in to show my faith in God and His system of salvation and to show my love of God and the gospel. Salvation then is not a matter of passiveness but activity on my part to receive what God's done for me that I never could do for myself. So if I want God to forgive me of my sins against Him, then I must realize as a free moral agent, I have a personal responsibility to do certain things. What things? Well, those things set out in the will of heaven. Those things set out in the Word of God. In fact, if you take the word do, D-O, do, out of Christianity, you destroy it. Just read the New Testament about what it means to be active in the Lord, to be faithful to the Lord. In every case, your faith is seen by your activity. And your love of God and the things of God is seen by your activity. James reasons, well, if you're going to show me your faith without your works, works of obedience, then I'll show you my faith really in the only way anybody can. And that is to do what God said and the way he said for the reason he said, to fully obey him. Same is true of love. That's the reason the love principle never rises higher or sets aside or makes null and void the authority principle. Study in the Old and New Testaments, and you will plainly see that in every case, one manifests his love of God and the things of God by humbling himself and obeying God's will. And Jesus said to the apostles in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, American Standard says, 1901, ye will keep my commandments. The phrase, to be saved, denotes the purpose of complying with the conditions. What does that mean? Well, it means to be saved is the object sought by the one who says, what must I do to be saved? That's what I'm interested in. I want to be saved from my sins. I know God forgives me and only He can forgive me. So what must I do for God to save me from my sins? So the phrase also suggests that the saving is done by another. Now you'll see Peter saying, save yourselves from this untoward a crooked generation. But in that sense, he means you have an obligation to accept God's will and comply with it so God can save you. So it's not trying to say man can author his own gospel from his own think so and be saved by it. It means you have an obligation, as we said earlier. What must I do? Activity on my part. So if we're to be saved by God, we must be passive in the sense that we submit to the will of God when it pertains to what must we do to be saved. But when it comes to being active, it's obvious we do something, God's will. So let's consider a sure way to answer this question. And I don't think there could be a plainer and surer way to answer the question than to turn to the Bible and read the question and the answer given wherever it's found. Now, you know that people say, oh, pick up the Bible guess You mean I've got to take that much time? Well, you really don't want to be interested in being saved, do you? Do you admit the Bible and the Bible only is God's communication with you? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, James 1, verse 25. Well, if so, then you're going to use this life for what God intended, to learn His will and do it. Because when you hear the conclusion of the whole matter, it's to fear God to keep His commandments. Well, you can't keep what you don't know. You can't do when you don't know what to do or how to do it. And you learn that from a diligent study of the Scriptures. So if the question's found a hundred times or five hundred times or a thousand times, then we must read each question and each answer that's given. Doing this will present the whole truth of God's Word on this matter. So the question, what must I do to be saved, is found only four times. Four times in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And one of these is under the law. 
of Moses. The question was first asked by the rich young ruler who came to Jesus saying, Good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Mark 10, 17. Well, being Jews and that they approached God through the law of Moses, Jesus referred him to the Ten Commandments. So that lets us know further that at that time, as we studied last week in the right division of the Word, 2 Timothy 2.15, that the Mosaic law was enforced at that time. Christ had not died. He had not, if you please, nailed that law to his cross. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. So it was a Jew's duty to keep it. And the young man replied that these have I kept from my youth up. Mark 10, 20. Well, that's his reply. An inspiration infallibly records what he said. I don't know whether he had or he hadn't. But that's what he said in answer to Jesus' question. And if it's true, all that's well and good. But then Jesus said in Mark 10 and 21, yet you lack one thing. That ought to cause anybody to see the seriousness of serving God and learning our duty to God. Jesus said you lack one thing. The law of Moses then not yet taken out of the way. He was to keep it, but he lacked one thing. He had a stumbling block, and that stumbling block was materialism, Mark 10, 22. He only intended to obey whatever the law said if it pleased him, suited him, or was convenient to him, or fit in his own scheme of things. He was, if you please, attempting to serve God with reservations. That never happens. It's impossible to serve God with revelations. It's either all or none. And so many are like that today. They pick and choose cafeteria style what part of the Bible they do. And usually if it's going to demand a whole lot out of them, they won't do it. Host of folks are around like that. And we in the church are expected to live godly lives before the world and one another and teach the gospel to every creature. You need to understand that when we start teaching the gospel, there are people out there like that. You may study with them for a while until it comes to a point in their life that they just don't want to submit to God. Well, the answer, though, would not be given today. For we're under the New Testament, the new law, the perfect law of liberty. The question, what must I do to be saved, was also asked of the Jews on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus. And you don't get the answer to them that Jesus gave to the rich young ruler. Because they're under the law of Christ. The church is established on that day. And the gospel in all of its fullness is preached on that day. And the gospel is God's power to save in the Christian dispensation. Romans 1.16 So in Acts 2 we read of the Holy Spirit coming upon the apostles to endow them with the divine strength they needed to do the work God had called them to do or Jesus specifically had called them to do the object of which then was to guide them and direct them in receiving the truth, whether Jesus taught it or there's more truth to be revealed, and be able to prove it by miracle signs and wonders. Jews from every nation were there and all heard Peter's sermon as well as the other apostles who preached. And they heard it preached to them in their own native language, Acts chapter 2, verse 6. And if you look in chapter 2, you will see how Peter concluded that sermon. You see in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36 that he says, Therefore, in other words, in the light of all this evidence I provided for you, the miracles that came upon us from heaven with the cloven tongues like as of fire setting upon us, us speaking languages we never studied, and so on, then the testimony we gave and the scriptures we preached, all of that together, therefore, that all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So it becomes obvious as to where he was going when it came to preach the truth. And then notice the Jews' response in Acts 2 and verse 37. Well, the Scripture says they were pricked in their heart. What pricked them in their inward man? What hurt their conscience? Well, they're devout, devout Jews. They're sincerely doing what they know or what they think is right. They don't realize that they need to get off that sinking ship of Judaism. It will not serve its purpose anymore. 
It was a law to bring them to Christ, Paul said in Galatians 3.24, and to Christ they've now come, and they hear then the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they cry out, having been pricked in their heart by the truth, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter answers them as believers. They've been persuaded by the truth. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10.17. And being believers, Peter takes them and tells them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now the question would come up, and I've already answered it, but we'll emphasize it here. Why weren't they told to believe? Is the Great Commission, when you read it, doesn't it say in Mark's account, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved? But they weren't told to believe here. Well, he took them where they found them. It's evidenced by their crying out, since the truth picked their hearts, that they believe it. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter tells them, unlike most preachers today, who would have said, well, there's nothing you can do. Don't I ever ask a question like that. But they didn't know any better. They just heard the truth preached and realized they had to, as a free moral agent, if they wanted God to forgive them, they had to do something. Well, he tells them plainly to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's why they weren't told to believe at that point, because there's evidence they've already believed. So much that they wanted to be saved from their sins. Now, according to Peter, the inspired Peter, baptism, immersion in water, is just as essential as repentance for the remission of sins. That is, for salvation. Salvation requires more than faith. Faith is essential. You don't rule it out. It's necessary. But a, curse, a person can believe that Christ is the Son of God and you have faith in Him. But for various reasons, you may not obey Him. So it takes faith and plus baptism to be saved. Salvation requires then more than faith. It requires a change of the inward man. As free moral agents, we must will to change our will to seek after God to do His will. Acts 2 and verse 41. Now you remember in the case of Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, that he asked, what must I do to be saved in Acts chapter 9? Saul is first mentioned in connection with the stoning of Stephen. He agreed to it, thought it was the right thing to do. Acts 7 and verse 58 and chapter 8 verse 1. And he's mentioned as a severe persecutor of the church, Acts 8 and verse 3. In all of this, Saul thought he was doing right, thought he was serving God. He lived in all good conscience before God, Acts 23 and 1, Acts 26 and 9. So our conscience alone is not a safe guide in religion. Our conscience simply says, feel good. You've lived by the standard you believe God said you should live by. Feel bad. You have violated that standard. But the standard may not be God's will at all. Jacob of old was informed by the brothers of Joseph when they concocted their deceptive uh, action that Joseph was dead, but he wasn't. And yet Jacob had all the experience of one who had lost a son in sorrow but it was a lie that he believed. So your conscience can react according to what you think the truth is, even when it's not the truth. So we have to be sure that our conscience is operating on the basis of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. John 8, 31 and 32. But you can't depend solely on your conscience. Old Jiminy Cricket back in the Walt Disney movie Pinocchio said, let your conscience be your guide. It won't work. Unless you have been programmed by learning and information what the real standard of truth is. Then it will work. You'll notice in Acts 9, 3 through 5, uh, the amazing event did not save Paul, as some falsely assume. That is the appearing of Jesus to him on the road to Damascus, Acts 9, 6. There was something yet Saul must do, though he was a believer. It's obvious he repented. For he did what the Lord told him to do in going into Damascus to the street called Straight, and there it will be told thee what thou must do. But it, the gospel's in human vessels. So the Lord appeared to a gospel preacher, and I said, you go there. He's waiting on you. 
And, of course, Ananias was pretty frightened. But he didn't listen. That is, the Lord did to his objection, told him to go and do what he was told to do. And he did. And he found out that there was this man, blind, and had been fasting for three days and three nights, recognizing all those things indicated belief and repentance. So what did Saul lack? He wasn't belief. He had believed. It was not repentance, for he was so penitent that he spent those three days blind and fasting, praying, no nourishment. So what did he lack? Paul tells us in Acts twenty two sixteen, as he recounts his own conversion. And I said, Now, why tearest thou? Rise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins. So here Saul was, when the preacher came to him, a believer who had repented. Well, no use telling him to believe repent. He's already done it. So he takes the man where he finds him and tells him the rest of the gospel story. So if Paul were saved on the road to Damascus, let me ask you this. Why is he so miserable when Ananias finds him? The Ethiopian eunuch, when he was baptized, went on his way rejoicing. If uh, he was saved, that is Saul, why is he miserable? The truth is he was not saved from his sins until after he was baptized, though he had had faith and repented of his sins. Consider also the account of the Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas were prisoners. They had preached the gospel and got themselves in prison, in prison because they loved the truth and preached it. Didn't apologize for it. Acts 16, 25 through 30. The jailer was certainly an unbeliever. And there's no evidence that he ever had heard the gospel at all. So in answer to his question, and it serves, what must I do? Paul says what he did in 1631. You've got to believe. Well, if you come across somebody that doesn't believe in God or doesn't believe in Christ, he must believe. Hebrews 11 and verse 1, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek after him. So, uh, verse 6. And so it is uh, that the story doesn't end there. When he hears the truth, he can have faith. Now we're back to Mark 16, verse 16. The truth created faith, Romans 10, 17. And they baptized him, Acts 16, 32. That's in complete harmony with the plan set out in the Great Commission that Mark records in Mark 16, 16. So he had to have the wherewithal to be brought to belief. He had to hear the Word of God preached to him. He had to have the evidence that would show Christ of Nazareth was the Son of God. And that's what you have in the teaching recorded in Acts 16, verse 33. Now, we know this mostly here, but for people who are listening, why have we seen three different answers given to the same question? I really already covered it. You know it. The jailer was an unbeliever. He had to believe. He was told to believe. He was given the wherewithal so he could believe. The gospel was preached to him. He then repented and was baptized. The people on Pentecost already bought to belief. They recognized their lost condition. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And as believers, they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. Saul was believing and a penitent person when the gospel preacher got to him. So he was told as a believing, penitent person to be baptized to wash away his sins. Well, there are different answers then because they were at different places on the road to salvation. We must ask ourselves, if we're not a Christian, as the Bible defines and uses that term, one who's of Christ, how do I become a Christian? Well, I think we've studied it. So, we've often used this, whatever state I might be in. But if a person is in Houston and asks how far is it from here to Dallas, he's going to get one answer. But if he gets up here to Madisonville and asks somebody there how far is it from here to Dallas, he's going to get another answer. And if he gets on up the road somewhere and asks again, he'll get another answer. Why? Because of where he is on the road to Dallas. That's exactly why. That doesn't seem difficult to me. So in right and dividing the word of truth, as you study the last will and testament of Christ, and you're asking, what must I do to be saved? Then first of all, you have to get to Jesus. He's the Savior. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. And the New Testament is his last will and testament. So if you want to know what Jesus has to say about what must you do or I do in order to be saved from my sins against God, I've got to go to his last will and testament. I won't go to the Old Testament. 
I will go to the New Testament and I will see with meekness the engrafted word concerning my salvation that is set out in the New Testament as we've even studied this morning. So let us be concerned about where we are on the road to salvation. Are you a believer? Wonderful. You have to believe. But have you repented of your sins? If not, before you can be baptized for the remission of sins, you must repent of your sins. There must be a change of mind. Your will must be broken down to turn from the way you've been living that's sinful and separated you from God to turn to serving God. Now you're qualified to confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10.10. 10. Now you're ready to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of your sins. What must I do to be saved? I suggest to my brethren that as you strive to teach people the truth, just begin with that question. You might even ask the person, well, what did you do to be saved from your sins? Can you tell me what to do to be saved from my sins? There's no way you can raise those questions and dodge the Bible. <laughs> no way. It gives you a chance to discuss sin, who we sinned against, what sin does to us, and why we should be concerned about being saved from our sins. So a lot of things don't take deep knowledge of the Greek and Hebrew and all sorts of things like that. It takes simply a cursory understanding of the truth because you love the truth and simply calls people to say, what must I do to be saved? So the answer is hear the gospel of Christ, believe it, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, be immersed in water for the remission of sins. Then the last thing, be faithful all your life in the church, doing what God says members of the church ought to do, and heaven will be your home when you die. If you're not a Christian, we've certainly studied what must I do to be saved. And so you can be before you leave this building. As a child of God, if you have sinned, if you brought reproach on the church by your actions, if you're not serving your first love, you need to return. And that's going to involve repentance on your part and God's second law of pardon. Turning from those things and being determined to once again serve God faithfully. Confess those sins and pray to God for forgiveness. If you're subject to the gospel call, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.